We have some big solar flares, a far side blast, a radiation storm, an earth directed solar storm, some fast solar wind. Boy, is our sun waking up. Those stories and more in the news this week. If you want to learn how weather from our star causes impacts at the Earth that shape the future of our world, join professors Dr. Jenny Meehan, Michael Cook, and myself as we guide you through a space weather certificate program like no other. To enroll in the space weather and environment science program offered at Millersville University, go to Millersville dot edu slash swen. It's weather for the 21st century. This forecast also sponsored in part by CW Ops. Space weather this week is picking up in a big way. As we take a look at our Earth-facing disk, we do have a lot of active regions in Earth view, and some of them have gotten quite busy over the last couple days. We've also had quite a few solar storm launches. Most of them have been pretty small, at least early on. You can see a little filament eruption here. You can see POW right there. That was an Earth-directed solar storm. But most of these, as they've hit or grazed by Earth, really haven't yet amounted to much, so we haven't been all that excited. However, all of that changed right around the 21st. You can see this filament up here in the west. It lights off in a gorgeous display. Look at that whoosh. And that is because it was pinned between region 3989 and region 4001. And this kind of started like a signal that all of the activity is going to start ramping up now. We're seeing region 4001 starting to fire big solar flares along with region 4000. We've popped like six big flares over the last three days. In fact, uh, you can see 4001 on the 23rd begin to pop big M-class flares. There was one. And then it pops an X2 flare. You can see late here on the 23rd. Wait for it. Pow! Right there. That was an R3 level radio blackout. You can see it right there. And even though it didn't last all that long because this flare was occulted, meaning that the region was rotating behind the sun's uh, west limb, it blocked part of that flare. A lot of people that are amateur radio operators noticed the big radio blackout. And that's because this thing had a lot of energy. We had a radio burst up to 18 gigahertz. And that even affects Starlink. So some of you Starlink users, you might have had uh, any dropout or any dropout during the 23rd. Well, now you know why. Anyway, after that, we actually been paying close attention to region 4000 as well, because if you look at this region in here, you will see POW right there. That was an M-class flare, but did you see the dimming that happened? That actually was an Earth-directed solar storm, but it was hard to see because once again, I'm going to back it up a little bit, this region fired at the same time. Watch, you can see that dimming region and something release right there at the same time. So we've got another Earth-directed solar storm, but it's kind of camouflaged, so there hasn't been a lot of model runs on it. But we'll talk more about that when we get into the stereo imagery. Meanwhile, keep your eye on this part of the sun right here. You'll watch it whoosh. Did you see that? That was a massive solar storm launch. In fact, as we take a look at this far side blast, look at this coronagraph signature. It's absolutely massive. It also launched an S1 level radiation storm, which we're dealing with right now and will likely be near S1 levels over the next 24 hours before things begin to calm down. But believe it or not, that's still not the only story. We've got region 3996 right here in 3998, and you'll see POW right there. There's yet another big solar storm. This one is nearly Earth-directed, but it looks like it's going to miss Earth off to the west. So while these regions continue to rotate in through Earth view and rotate to the sun's west limb, we're going to continue to have these big solar flares as well as potential solar storm launches headed toward Earth. So we need to stay on our toes over the next couple days, but then things hopefully will start settling down. And now switching to our far-sided sun, we're finally able to use Stereo A imagery again because Stereo A has moved to the side of Earth enough to begin to see the far side. In fact, you can see here's Earth Here's the sun and here's Stereo A staring at the sun just a little bit from the side. So some of these active regions might be familiar, but we can see further away. In fact, here is that filament region that we were talking about earlier, that sandwich between region 3989 and region 4001. And you can watch this thing on the 21st. Look at that gorgeous eruption. And as it continues to move on, you'll see it continue to light up several times and launch more than once. Now here's region 4000, and this is the area that on the 21st, 
24th launches that Earth-directed solar storm. You can see that dimming right here, but you can also see now, see that big filament channel had also lit up. So when we take a look at stereo uh, coronagraph imagery for this, sadly, here is the big eruption from that side. Right, you can see it, this eruption going off to the side right there. But if you look super carefully, you see something else that looks like it could be part of a halo. We think it's this eruption here, but my goodness, this is super hard to model. Look at that. You see this little kind of line going through here? That looks like that's part of this eruption. But my goodness, it's very difficult to get a, a decent forecast. So we do think that there's something coming, but it is, as you can tell, camouflaged. So that becomes the biggest problem during uh, really active times like this, where we just don't have enough, uh, you know, enough images to be able to separate all of these different eruptions when they occur. Meanwhile, you can see that big coronal hole uh, rotating very clearly, and you can watch, look at that, look at that big eruption. This was that big so far-sighted blast that caused that big S1 level radiation storm. So we are going to be watching region 3991 as well as 3989 and 4001 as they rotate to the sun's far side and, and survive their far side passage because they could be big flare players as uh, things return here in about two weeks. Now, switching back to that Earth-directed solar storm, we take a look at our solar storm prediction model, Enlil. Now, this is NASA's version of the model, and you're looking down at the sun from the North Pole with Earth being off to the right. And as we set this solar storm model in motion, you'll see that solar storm being launched. You can see it here. It's going to be kind of a glancing blow, but it's expected to be hitting Earth uh, late on the 26th into the 27th. Likely, it'll be a bit fashionably late. We're hoping it's going to be a little bit more of a direct hit than this glancing blow. But again, because of the coronagraph imagery, it's really hard to tell. So this is just an estimate. So war photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you're definitely going to get a show because it's likely going to be coming in with the fast wind stream. You can't really tell here, but this blue right here is the fast solar wind. So it will be kind of on the, the front end of that fast solar wind, which could give us some enhanced effect effects, and it could actually bring aurora down to mid-latitudes. Switching to our moon, we are passing through the third quarter phase on our way to a new moon, with the new moon being on the 27th. And by the third, the moon will still be about 15% illuminated. So Unite Sky Watchers, if you want to catch those dim objects in the sky, like, I don't know, maybe some aurora, well, now is your perfect chance. Now, stepping outside to take a look at our live conditions using our global geochron map, the first thing we take a look at is the radio blackout threat meter using DRAP. And you can see it's quite colorful, and this is mainly because of the radio blackouts due to solar flares on Earth's day side. You can see them lighting up like this, but it gets lights up like a Christmas tree as soon as our S1 radiation storm hits, and you can see that here at the poles. But luckily, we don't have any issues on Earth's night side. That is very typical. Amateur radio and HF radio propagation seems to be pretty good, at least at the beginning of this radiation storm, which occurred the latter part of the 24th. But as we flip to our GPS scintillation risk, also known as ROTI, it's an index that talks about where GPS signal degradation will, could be very, very high. Uh, we take a look and see, as that radiation storm began to peak, we really see a lot of activity down here at low latitudes, especially located near central uh, part of South America, but it also stretches clear out into Hawaii area and also to West Africa and South Africa as well. This is kind of the Bermuda Triangle of space weather right here. It's called the South Atlantic Anomaly. And that really began to peak and cause some real problems for uh, GPS users in this area. And it will likely continue to over the next day or so as that uh, radiation storm continues to wane. As a matter of fact, as we flip back to our DRAP model, you can see the radiation storm is beginning to die down here over the next, you know, over this, this coming day, the colors are beginning to kind of go back down. So that's good news there. But these radio blackouts continue to uh, cause problem for HF radio on Earth's day side. You'll see there's a M36, uh, 3.6 class flare, and you can see uh, that, that near R2 level radio blackout, you can actually see the amateur radio signals kind of get weak in that region before the thing begins to die down. So this is going to be the conditions here over the, it's been the conditions over the last 24 hours and will continue to be the conditions as we move on into the next couple days. But as far as aurora is concerned, well, you know, we've actually not been seeing all that much aurora over the last couple days. 
However, Aurora is beginning to build now. Over the last few hours, you can see it start building like this. And that's going to be on our way to getting that uh, fast solar wind along with that solar storm that's on its way to Earth. That should be hitting us right around the 26th. So Aurora photographers, it looks like we're beginning to get some preconditioning here with the Aurora. So it's good news because that could mean Aurora will definitely make it down to mid-latitudes. Now, switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are anticipating the hit from that Earth-directed solar storm, which should be followed by a fast wind chaser. So at high latitudes, NOAA is expecting active to possibly minor storm conditions with up to about a 50 or 60 percent chance of a major storm. Somewhere in the 27th is probably when we're going to see the peak. And then things will slowly kind of wane a little bit because we have that fast solar wind that should give an extended aurora show for you uh, high latitude observers. Now, mid-latitudes, we're only expecting unsettled to active conditions, but we do have up to about a 30% chance of a major storm. It really depends upon how much of a glancing blow that Earth-directed solar storm is. Remember, this is that solar storm that was really hard to predict because it was basically camouflaged in coronagraphs. So we have a lot of error in this one. That's why you're seeing the difference between active and major storm. Really don't know. It could be, you know, anything in this very wide margin. So just keep on your toes if you're a mid-latitude aurora photographer. We could actually see some some uh, impacts from the high speed wind as the, this, uh, as the stream kind of comes through, that could give us a chance for more aurora as well. So I'm keeping the active uh, possibilities out through about March 1st before things begin to finally calm down. And now switching to our solar flare and dayside radio blackout outlook over the coming week, we are still sitting at the high uh, 190s, which will likely die down just a little bit as a lot of these really active regions are rotating to the sun's uh, west limb and will soon be disappearing to the sun's far side. We are still sitting at moderate noise on the bands, and I've stretched that out through the five day. NOAA's giving us about a 65% chance of M-class flares. This is at the R1 to R2 level radio blackout, and that will continue over the next few days, but expect a tapering off of that as well. So expect the noise on the bands to disappear, you know, die down at least a little bit. We also have about a 25% chance of X-class flares at the R3 level radio blackout. That's also going to start dwindling about Friday into the weekend. Things should be calming down just a little bit. And by next week, things should start getting really quiet. So amateur radio operators just hang in there because these solar flares will likely die down over this next week. And then the week after, uh-oh, things might start getting active again. And now switching to our radiation storm and polar aviation outlook over the coming week. Well, sadly, not everything's in the green this week. We are sitting at the D2 minor range. This is at flight level 360 for you aviators. It's also the S1 radiation storm for uh, level for everyone else. We are dealing with stormy conditions right now. We're kind of hovering in and around that S1 level. That might actually peak a little bit above the S1 level as we move into the 27th. It's kind of hard to tell as that solar storm goes by us, but then it should drop reasonably quickly. NOAA's giving us about a 95% chance of staying at that S1 level through the 26th. It drops to about a 55% chance uh, on the 27th, and then it continues to per precipitously die down after that. So expect by March 1st or 2nd, we'll be back in the into the green. Uh, you frequent flyers, and this does include air crew and you high-risk passengers, please take uh, care and take a look at those ICAO advisories. Uh, pay attention to them because things can change very, very quickly. And please take these uh, issues into consideration in your flight plans. So the space weather this week has gotten very active. Not only have we had a number of big solar flares, but we also have an Earth-directed solar storm. Now, of course, this solar storm may be a glancing blow, but aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you could get an extended show. And aurora photographers at mid-latitudes, well, you know with that new moon, there's a very good chance that you're going to see something, even if it's for a short little bit. So be sure to keep on your toes. Now, amateur radio operators and emergency responders, well, I know the bands kind of aren't that great right now. Now we've got a lot of radio blackouts and that radio blackout risk is remaining reasonably high. We also have that big radiation storm and that's not helping either. So you're just going to have to kind of tough it out over the next probably three to five days before things begin to kind of calm down. And next week looks like it's going to be a lot better for you. So just hang in there. And now you GPS users, well, you know, that radiation storm isn't helping too much when it comes to the poles. So navigation and, and reception is going to be pretty bad up there. Also on the night side, 
It's not helping very much if you're at low latitudes anywhere near that, you know, space weather Bermuda Triangle that we call the South Atlantic Anomaly. So be aware of that too. And then of course, near dawn and dusk, that's not the greatest because of these solar flares. And oh my goodness, when the solar storm hits, you're not going to want to be anywhere near Aurora either. So I think you're getting the worst end of the deal of everybody this week. So just hang in there and fly with vigilance and be sure to calibrate your magnetometer often. I'm Tamitha Scove, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching.